We're working on chapter six now, sedimentary rocks. And when you think about sedimentary rocks, please think about the rocks we covered in sedimentary rocks lab. We had detrital, sedimentary rocks, chemical, and biological. Those are the three textures. You should remember that your detrital sedimentary rocks include conglomerate, breccia, quartz sandstone, arcose, siltstone, and shale. And your chemical ones could include things like limestones that don't have fossils in them, and dola stone, and your biological ones include things like chert and flint, bituminous coal, and fossiliferous limestones. And, and so you want to figure out the texture whenever you pick up sedimentary rocks. Now, set, why do we study sedimentary rocks? Because that's how we study Earth history. The history of our planet is recorded in sedimentary rocks. So what you want to do when you look at sedimentary rocks is you want to figure out where did those rocks form. And you want to look at clues inside of those sedimentary rocks. Some of the best are fossils. Fossils are evidence of past life. And uh, let's say we're looking at a, a limestone bed and we find marine fossils in it. Well, that's great. That tells us that limestone formed in the ocean. We want to go a step further and figure out where in the ocean did it form, in the deep ocean or the shallow ocean. If you find um, bivalves and brachiopods, which are typical shallow marine organisms, you could say that limestone formed in the shallow ocean. Or if we look at a chert, C-H-E-R-T, we might find radiolariums and diatoms in them. We'll take a look at those later. Those are organisms that lived in the deep ocean. Other organisms only live in fresh water. Let's say we found freshwater fish in a shale. Then we know that shale must have formed in a lake or in a river. Other organisms live in cold environments, like glacial environments. Others live in the desert. So look at fossils. To that could tell you us where did that rock form, and what depositional environment did it form in. Also, geologists, um, let's say you got a degree at UT and, and you were hired to find valuable natural resources and get them out of the sedimentary rocks. What kind of valuable natural resources can you obtain from sedimentary rocks? Many. Oil, gasoline in, the, in your gas tank comes from geologists looking through sedimentary rocks looking for it. Natural gas used to heat your home. Coal, sand and gravel. You've seen sand and gravel pits all around wherever you live, be it Knox County or Anderson County, Morgan County, Campbell County. Why do we mine sand and gravel? It's used to make concrete. Gypsum comes from sedimentary rocks and is used to make drywall. All the drywall you see at Lowe's and Home Depot, it's made of gypsum that's, a, that's mined out of the ground from sedimentary rocks. Quartz and quartz sandstones can be used to make abrasives, including sandpaper. It's also used to make glass. You melt quartz crystals and quartz grains you, and you quench it very quickly, you make gla glass, glassware. Quartz is also used to make computer chips. Phosphates are mined out of sedimentary rocks to make fertilizer for farmers, or iron ore, all the metal that we use in our modern life, including for automobiles. It's made from smelting iron ore, which are obtained from sedimentary rocks. When you look at sedimentary rocks, uh, let's say uh, for a moment, imagine that you're not looking at your computer, but instead you are, you and I are standing here in front of this stack of sedimentary rocks. You've already learned a lot about geology and you can see these layers or beds and therefore you know these are sedimentary without even walking up close. And we, you and I, we take out a tape measure, measure 
out the thickness of these red beds, and we find out there are coasts. And then we find siltstones going all the way up to here. And, we, and then we find chalk here in this lighter beds. And in this brown beds, we have limestone. Well, what we can do next is we can make a stratigraphic column. which we map out and show what we see at that particular particular location. So here's one bed, and here's another bed, and here's another bed, and we describe each of these sedimentary beds. And then we try and figure out in what depositional environment do these rocks form in. So we know how the environment changed at this particular location. Let's say that these were formed on the land, these arcoses, and the siltstone was formed in a lake. And then all of a sudden we have chalk and limestone up here and they form in the shallow ocean. Well, we automatically know that first, that what happened here is a transgressive sequence because sea level rose and covered up these old lake beds and um, land environments. That's why we have chalk and limestone on top. So geologists work both in the field and in the lab. When you work in the field, you usually get a, uh, let's say you work for an oil company or a mining company. They give you a truck or SUV and you take some field equipment out with you, hammers and uh, acid bottle to see if there's limestones or a piece of glass to see if um, you got any quartz. And then we would take a look at our sedimentary rocks, a tape measure, and we look, note any fossils we see, and we try and figure out, we try to draw up a stratigraphic column. Here's a stratigraphic column for the Grand Canyon, for example. Usually work in pairs. And then laboratory investigations, you take those rocks back you identify the fossils, you do chemical analyses, and you look at those sedimentary rocks underneath a microscope. So detrital sedimentary rocks come from the weathering of pre-existing rocks, the breaking down of pre-existing rocks, be they igneous, metamorphic, or sedimentary. They're broken down by the forces of nature. Water, wind, or ice can tear apart rocks producing particles, which we call sediment. And these particles can be moved by water, wind, or ice to another location and then deposited into layers or beds. Detrital sedimentary rocks came from pre-existing rocks that were eroded or weathered, then transported from that side of weathering and then deposited into beds. Chemical sedimentary rocks form from the evaporation of water. For example, if you go to, uh, if, I don't know if you've ever been to the desert, but in the desert you have these lakes that dry up. These are called playa lakes, P-L-A-Y-A. -A. Well, when they all dry up, the minerals crystallize out, and you make a chemical sedimentary rocks out of these, like rock gypsum. Rock gypsum is used to make drywall. That's a chemical sedimentary rock. When you think about detrital sedimentary rocks, and please don't forget that the detrital sedimentary rocks we have are breccia, conglomerate, quartz sandstone, arco, siltstone, and shale. We want to think about the three S's, size, shape, and sorting. So th those are the clues we've got when you're looking at the trital sedimentary rocks. We want to look at size, shape, and sorting. Let's do size first. So, let's do size. 
here's a size chart and we have um, let's see, let me get a better one than this one You can see this is uh, the size chart for different particles or sed sediment in um, the trial sedimentary rocks. The smallest particles are clay, and they are any clay is any particle with a diameter of one over less than one over two hundred fifty sixth of a millimeter would be clay. So clay is the finest particle size, the finest grain size. When clay lithifies and becomes sedimentary rock, it becomes shale. Silt is the second largest, I mean the second smallest particle size. And when it lithifies, it becomes siltstone. Siltstone consists of particles that are fine, very fine, but not as fine as clay. They're between 1 16th of a millimeter and 1 over 256 of a millimeter in diameter. Sand. We all know what sand looks like. You've been in a sandbox when you were a kid. You've seen sand in the river or on a beach. Sand particles are bigger than silt particles. They're between 1 16th of a millimeter and 2 millimeters in diameter. And a millimeter is about the thickness of a dime, a 10 cent piece. When sand becomes sedimentary rock, it becomes sandstone, either quartz sandstone or arcos. If it's arcos, it has a reddish color. Gravel is bigger than sand, and it's any particle bigger than two, with a, par, a diameter bigger than two millimeters, like the gravel on the bottom of a riverbed, or the gravel on the bottom of your aquarium. If the gravel is angular, it's breccia, it makes breccia. If it's rounded, it becomes conglomerate. So the first thing you want to look at when you look at a detrital sedimentary rock is how big are the is the sediment. That way you can figure out what rock you're looking at. Clay, siltstone, quartz sandstone, arcos, or breccia and conglomerate. Also, size tells you something. It tells you how fast the currents were moving in the environment where the detrital sedimentary rock formed. Think about it. If you've got a fast flowing river, you can move big particles, can't you? And the finer particles will get washed away. So in a depositional environment with fast, high energy environments, like a fast flowing river, you're gonna get coarser grained detrital sedimentary rocks such as conglomerate. Now if you have a lake or a lagoon then the water is very still and then the fine particles can settle to the bottom. So a shale would form in a low energy environment such as a lake or a lagoon. So bottom line is the size of the particles tells you how fast when you're dealing with a high energy or a low energy depositional environment. High energy depositional environment would have a coarser grain size. A lower energy environment would have a finer grain size. Now we want to look at grain shape in and for detrital sedimentary rocks. So when you look at detrital sedimentary rocks, another thing you can look at is the shape of the particles. And in order to do that, we want to use words like roughness, and the opposite of roughness is smoothness. And we want look are the look are the particles elongate, or are they equant? Those are the four words we're going to use to determine shape. Okay, an elongate particle is one with where it's very long on one end and short on the other end. An equant particle is where all sides are about the same.
Okay, now let's take a look here. So here you can see which particles are equant. The ones on top, which sand grains are equant? The ones on top or the ones on bottom? Well, the ones on the bottom here are elongate. They've got a long end and a short end to them. The ones on the top are equant. Basically, there is no long and short end. That the thickness of this grain is the same in every direction. So the top six sand grains that you see here are equant. The top, the bottom six ones are elongate. Next thing we can look at is roughness and smoothness. Are the particles rough or smooth? Well, do you think the particles here to the right are smoother? Yes. So these particles here are smooth, and then we get the rougher and rougher particles as we go over here. So this particle here is elongate and smooth. This one is equant and smooth. This one is equant and rough. This one is elongate and rough. So we look at the particles and we try and figure out what the shape of the particles are. Why in God's name do we want to do that? Well, for a lot of different reasons. First thing is, do you think if a particle traveled a great distance, imagine sand grains uh, moving downstream towards the ocean. Where do those sand grains come from? They came from upstream, from the erosion of other rocks. If those sand grains did not travel a great distance, they would tend to be more rough and elongate like this because they didn't have any time to lose their edges, to become smooth and to be more equant. They were eroded upstream and they just fell into the riverbed. They hadn't traveled. But now let's say the sand grain has traveled for hundreds or even thousands of miles. That sand grain is going to roll on the bottom of the river channel and become smoother and smoother as it gets downstream and more and more equant as we go downstream. So, the shape of the particles tells us how far did those sediment grains, those, the, how far did the sediment travel? The more smooth and equant the particles are like this, the farther that sediment has traveled. Such as we will see for beach sands. They tend to be equal, the equant and smooth. Particles that are more elongate and rough were eroded and just deposited and they hadn't traveled very far. So shape of the particles tells us how far did the sediment travel. Let's take a look here at two examples of how we can use shape. First, let's take a look at what beach sand looks like and we'll look under a microscope so, so we can see it better. Here's a typical beach sand. Notice how equant and smooth the particles are. You should know by now if you see round, smooth, equant particles, that sand traveled a great distance. Think about it. Where does beach sand come from? It comes from rivers. And so that sa those sand grains traveled along the bottom of the river channel and got smoother and smoother as they moved down the river channel. So these particles, they rolled along the bottom of the river channel, becoming smoother and smoother and more equant with time. So shape of the particles, the smoother and more equant the particles are, the greater the distance they traveled. So beach sand is a good example of how we can use shape to determine that those sand grains traveled a great distance to get to that beach. Now, if we look at another type of sedimentary deposit called glacial till, T-I-L-L, -L, it looks like this. And glacial till like this, T-I-L-L, -L, you're not going to see it in Tennessee. 
because the glaciers never reach this far down south. But in Canada, this is very common, eh? Look how rough the particles are, and you got lots of elongate particles. This sediment did not travel a great distance. It was just dumped out by the ice. So look at the shapes of the particles, and they could tell us how far did the sediment travel. Shape uh, of particles is also useful for police officers, believe it or not. I had a police officer, she took my class, and she wanted to study shape, a par shapes of particles. Why? Why is the police department interested in that? Well, think about it. If you're trying to solve a case and some criminal says he was not at the site where the crime was committed, look at the person's shoes. There are grooves in, in the shoes, on the soles of your shoes, and you can dig out the particles from there and look at the shapes of the particles and compare them to the, that uh, of the crime scene and determine whether or not the person was there. Or... You could look at the um, sand grains that are trapped between the tire treads and see if someone was at a particular location or not. So shape is very useful to, in that way too. Next thing we want to use it, look at when we're looking at detrital sedimentary rocks is sorting. So... Let's take a look at sorting here for a moment. Okay, so size, shape, and sorting. Sorry, it's slow, slow loading here. Kind of slow there. Okay. By Maggie Williams, whoever she is. Let's see. Okay, here's a picture here that shows sorting. This is a very well-sorted detrital sedimentary rock. Here's a very poorly sorted detrital sedimentary rock. Using words in the English language, or en français, describe the difference between a very well-sorted detrital sedimentary rock or a very poorly sorted detrital sedimentary rock. A well-sorted detrital sedimentary rock has particles that are all or almost all the same size. A poorly sorted detrital sedimentary rock contains particles of all different sizes. For example, this very poorly sorted detrital sedimentary rock has gravel, sand, silt, and clay all mixed together, whereas this is only made of sand. Sediment is transported by water, wind, or ice, and the farther it travels, the more well sorted it becomes. So sorting also tells you how far did the sediment travel before it was deposited. The more well sorted the the detrital sedimentary rock is, the farther the sediment traveled. Poorly sorted sediment detrital sedimentary rocks, the sediment was eroded and just deposited. It, w it did not travel a great distance. So let's go back to our examples again. Beach sand under a microscope. Is beach sand well sorted or poorly sorted? Don't get confused by the colors of the different sand grains. Look, they're all the same size, aren't they? So this is a well sorted detrital sedimentary rock. This will become a quartz sandstone with well sorted with rounded equine particles. And you know, since it's well sorted, these sand grains traveled a great distance. Think about the Mississippi River. 
the biggest river in the United States. So the Mississippi begins up here in Minnesota. Yeah, you betcha. Begins up here in Minnesota. And then it goes all the way down here to Louisiana. So the particles travel all thousands of miles before they reach New Orleans. And that gives them time to become rounded. I mean, I mean smooth and equant and well sorted by the time they reach the delta. Now let's look at glacial till again, for example. Glacial till, is it well sorted? No, it's got big boulders and pebbles and, and it has sand and silt and clay all mixed together. It's poorly sorted. So it was not, it did not travel a great distance. It was eroded by some other rocks and the ice dumped them out and into these piles of glacial till. Is this particle described in terms of shape? It's elongate and smooth. How about this one here? It's equant and smooth. Which particle traveled a greater distance, A or B? This one or this one? This one traveled a greater distance. Because you, as a particle it's transported by water, wind, or ice, it loses its long ends and short ends. And so it becomes something more equant. Is this a poorly sorted detrital sedimentary rock? Or is this a well sorted detrital sedimentary rock? It's poorly sorted. Look, you got pebbles, you got gravel, you got sand, all kinds of different particles and sizes mixed together. So this is poorly sorted. So it did not travel a great distance. What kind of detrital sedimentary rock will this form, by the way, with rounded pebbles? Conglomerate. That's, and, and this, by the way, forms in rivers, usually, sometimes near the ocean, because the waves can move particles back and forth and smooth and round them down. The next video we'll talk about sedimentary structures.